Rick, I don't know if I've ever mentioned to you directly, but your book, Purpose Driven Church, was absolutely instrumental in my transition into full-time ministry 25 years ago. And because of that, it's really a privilege uh, to have this opportunity to have you on the podcast today. And especially related to this topic of preaching and teaching, uh, and not to suggest that you're old by any means, but you've been <laughs> preaching and teaching. Uh, you've been doing this for a long time. And, but for those who may, who may not be familiar with your story and that whole journey of yeah. just kind of getting into ministry, could you kind of go back and share a little bit of that for us? Uh, sure. Uh, well, first, thanks, Tony, for inviting me on. Uh, I'm a fourth generation pastor. My father, my grandfather, my great grandfather was led to Christ by Charles Spurgeon and was sent, went to Spurgeon's College and sent to America as a church planter and uh, served as a Union soldier, uh, a, a chaplain in uh, the Union Army during the Civil War and then planted churches all over. Um, I have been preaching, uh, this is my 52nd year in preaching. Uh, I, I uh, started preaching when I was 16. I was in high school. I was a junior in high school, uh, class president, student body president, and uh, God had called me to preach at actually a pretty young age, at 12, and at 16, I started speaking uh, all over, and every weekend I was gone. Um, I, before I was 20 years old, I had preached 120 um, harvest-type crusades, uh, wow. uh, citywide crusades. Uh, a local crusades before I was 20 years old, Billy Graham heard about this long haired, skinny kid preaching up a storm on the West coast. And <laughs> at 18 years old, he took me under his arm. And for the next 50 years, Billy Graham was one of my mentors. And uh, so I was involved in all of the conferences, helped plan Amsterdam 83, 86, Amsterdam 2000, uh, taught at those um, in Amsterdam 86, Billy Graham took my book, the first book I wrote called Bible Study Methods, Warren's Bible Study Methods. He translated it into 17 languages and gave it free to 14,000 delegates there and had me teach everybody how to study the Bible. Uh, because mm -hmm. preaching, good preaching comes out of good Bible study techniques. Um, so I started preaching, um, I've pastored four different churches, a rural church, an urban church, a suburban church, and an overseas church. Uh, the first church that I planted was when I was uh, 17 years old in my barn, my dad's barn in a rural area of Northern California in a little town of only 500 people called Redwood Valley. And uh, so uh, I, I grew that church to a whopping 26 people in a barn as a teenager. Uh, then the next church I planted was in Nagasaki, Japan. Uh, as an 18-year-old, uh, I went moved to Japan, and uh, while I was there, I was teaching English and planted a church, came back, worked in an inner city church in, in, L in L.A., where it was already about 68% Hispanic and built a ministry to gangs, and then finally in 1980, I planted a, a suburban church, Saddleback, so I've done urban, suburban, rural, and, uh, and international. And so I've preached in a lot of different kinds of uh, countries, uh, 165 nations now. Uh, and uh, and I've, I've only had two passions in life, uh, Tony. One was to pastor one church for life. Uh, I said, God, I'll go anywhere in the world if you let me spend my entire life in one location. And we actually thought we were going to China. But uh, we wanted to be missionaries, but that was during the Cultural Revolution in the 70s, and uh, uh, there were no way they were going to let Americans in. Yeah. So Kay and I ended up, the long story, it's in that book, Purpose Driven Church, how we ended up in Southern California, started Saddleback in January of 1980 with no members, no money, no building, no support, just Kay and I. I preached the first sermon to my wife. She said it was too long. It's been downhill ever since. 
<laughs> Does she still critique your messages, Rick? Oh, she still says they're too long. <laughs> uh, a moment ago, you were talking about the future of the church, and yeah. here's what I know: there have been se- uh, there are several well-known pastors in your generation that have yeah. started to pass the baton onto the next yeah. generation, and so. I'm just curious when you're thinking about this next generation of pastors, yes. what, what advice specifically would you give them related to preaching and teaching? Well, I, I think the first important thing, even before you start talking about preaching is to clarify what's the goal of your ministry. Now, everybody's going to say, well, the goal of my ministry is to glorify God. Of course it is. But how, how are you going to try to glorify God? And I, from the beginning, this is my 43rd year at Saddleback Church. We've already found my replacement. We haven't announced him, uh, the successor to me at Saddleback. Uh, But I've had four goals uh, my entire life in my preaching and in my ministry. One is I want to change the way unbelievers think about Jesus. I want to change the way unbelievers think about Jesus. The second goal is I want to change the way believers think about the Christian life, okay? And that's why I wrote that book, Purpose Driven Life, Mm -hmm. change the way believers think about the Christian life. Third, my goal was to change the way members think about the church, and and that's uh, that's what's PD Church. And then I want to change the way pastors think about preaching. Now, I don't have the final word on it. Uh, but I am thrilled with the, the results. And the fact is, in 43 years, I've baptized 57,000 new believers. Mm. 57,000 new believers. Uh, we've started over 7,000 small groups, 7,500 small groups. Uh, we've sent now over 28,000, 28,629 members of my church have served overseas on the mission field. I pastor a church of missionaries. And and when you sent 28,869 people overseas, when they come back, it changes their value system. Um, So these are the kind of things. How do you get that many people in the small groups? How do you get that many people saved and baptized? How do you get that many people to go on mission and ministry uh, around the world? It's all in your preaching. Uh, Rick, one of the aspects of your teaching that I've personally appreciated through the years is how you make your messages so relevant for my life, for people's lives. And I'm assuming that's very intentional. So uh, how is, I'm assuming this is a priority for you. And with that in mind, how do you approach your message preparation with that in mind? God gives us doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness. So that, for the purpose, is this. The purpose of Scripture is not to increase our knowledge, said D.L. Moody, but to change our lives. Jesus did not say, I have come that you might have information. And yet, that's what a lot of pastors think they're doing. I'm just teaching the information uh, of the Scripture. He said, I've come that you might have life. So the Bible reveals both our relationship to God and, and our relationship to others. That's the great commandment the Great Commission. It is to be life-oriented, not information-oriented. Now, if you buy into that, that's going to influence everything else in the way you prepare your messages, the way you deliver your messages, the way you evaluate your messages. If you realize that the purpose is to see change in the convictions and in the character and in the conduct of the listeners, not merely increase their knowledge, it'll, it'll change the way you preach. Well, speaking of that, uh, you've been teaching, as you mentioned earlier, more than 50 years. And in addition to the life change that you and I are experiencing, even today, society has changed quite a bit over the last 50 years. And so I'm curious, how, how has your teaching evolved over those many decades now? The scripture says, my word will not return void. But it's real clear that a lot of preaching is returning void today. When it does return void, what's the problem? Well, it's not the message, it's the way we're communicating it. 
when we have, because society is changing, churches are half empty and financially strapped and the moral climate of our community is, you know, decaying continues and Christians act no different than non-believers. And a uh, Christian gets divorced at the same rate of non-believers. Singles, Christian singles and teens are sleeping together. What, that's a problem of preaching. And, and, and so we basically invited the divisiveness of the world into the church. And, and there's a great sorting out going on right now. And I, I attribute that, that as a failure of preaching. Hmm. Now, part of the reason is this. Today, the average person, they're going to go home, turn on their TV, and they're going to watch three hours of cable TV at night. And there is no such thing as news anymore. It's all opinion. Tell me which channel you want to listen to, and I'll tell you what you're feeding yourself and what you're going to believe. True news really isn't out there anymore. Everything has an angle. And you tell me what kind of news you want to believe, and I'll tell you which network to listen to. Now, if you were getting three hours a night from commentator X or commentator Y, doesn't matter who it is, you're being discipled by them 15 hours a week, and then you're hearing your pastor one hour a week. Who's going to win in that battle? Yeah. Okay. And, and that's why preaching becomes even more important uh, since we don't have them uh, uh, as much as the world has them. And their world system and their value system is being shaped by commentators on cable TV rather than by, by the word of God. So, Rick, given kind of the crisis that we're facing, not only in our culture, but it's, it, as you've mentioned, it's come into our church as well. And yeah. as we wrap up this conversation, yeah. is there hope? And if so, what encouragement would you give to pastors and church leaders, especially in this season? Well, I would say don't give up. This is not the first crisis the church has been through. For 2,000 years, there's been, we have outlasted every dictator, every war, every famine, every critic, uh, whether it was Voltaire or some, or, or you know, Stephen Hawking, uh, it doesn't matter. The church is the only thing that's going to last. Everything man-made passes. This too shall pass. But heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word will not pass away. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of God abides forever. So focus on the things that aren't going to change. People are going to have the exact same problems in 20 years as they have now. They are going to be lonely. They're going to be angry. There'll be guilty, there'll be shame, there'll be affairs, there will be jealousy, uh, there will be conflict. The typical gospel presentation is this. Uh, you're a sinner, uh, you, you need to be forgiven, Christ died on the cross for you, and if you, if you accept this salvation, you'll go to heaven. 100% true. But it's interesting, that's not the only way people come to Christ. I just finished a study of the 88 personal encounters of Jesus in the New Testament. There are 88 of them, personal encounters, people who came to Jesus. Not one person in the New Testament came to Christ out of guilt. Not one, not one. Uh, about 38% of the people who came to Christ came because they were looking for healing. They had a hurt. They had a need. Uh, they had a crisis uh, in their life. And I'm predicting, Tony, I said this uh, two years ago when COVID was just getting started, that there's going to be a tsunami of grief in, in, the, in the years ahead, particularly in this next year, that pastors need to be prepared for and to preach about. Because even those who didn't lose a loved one to COVID, there, everybody had loss missed experiences. They couldn't go to the funeral of their dad. Uh, they missed the graduation. They missed the wedding. The wedding was pared down. They missed the birth of their grandchild. A thousand different experiences in life, people missed those. And there is a loss, a loss of fellowship, a loss of community, a loss of connection. And there's going to be a math. Once the fear, uh, and this is happening now, 
the fear of COVID resides, the, the massive, the next emotion is going to be a tsunami of grief. And pastors who understand how to deal with grief will here have an audience. <laughs>